So hello everyone, welcome to the Tashmir Conference 2024. I'm thrilled to introduce a session that promises to spark your curiosity and inspire innovative approaches to automation. So today we have Jason Huggins, a true pioneer in test automation and the founder of Tapster Robotics. Jason will be sharing his groundbreaking vision first approach to mobile automation. So this method leverages cameras, open source computer vision libraries and USB protocols to automate smartphones in a way that go beyond traditional methods. So Jason will walk us through what, why, and how of vision first testing, illustrating its application in the real world projects. We will also discuss the benefits, challenges, and key lessons learned from adopting this innovative approach. So these insights could prove invaluable as you refine your own automation strategies. So let's get started with Jason Huggins and explore the new possibilities in test automation. Over to you, Jason. All right, I hope everyone can see me and uh, hear me uh, okay. Um, I see a lot of thumbs up so far, so that's good. So I'm going to switch my, uh, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm in um, uh, South Bend, Indiana uh, right now. Anyway, um, but hello. Um, I'm going to switch to full screen on my presentation. So um, I'm not going to be able to see your comments until the very end. So we'll 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 see how this goes. Okay, here we go. And I'm going to play some videos, so it'll be it'll be an adventure. Make sure hopefully they all come through on on the on your side. Okay, here we go. I hope you all can see now. It says vision first test automation. I haven't gone completely uh, full screen yet though, so I still see some thumbs up. So, so I did see a comment. So what kind of videos, sir? It's a lot of little demos here. Also, because this is the Lambda test um, conference and it's all Lambda, uh, I just want to make sure this is super clear. This is not an advertisement for my stuff. This is an advertisement, if anything, for the ideas behind this. All of the things that I'm showing you are tools that you can get, like Raspberry Pis and like uh, you know things that you can 3D print and or buy off of Amazon or whatever. So um, the big thing is that I want you to, potentially I want to potentially spark some interest in vision uh, vision approaches to testing and I think this is kind of the future because it much meshes well with with um, all the AI stuff that's coming out okay anyway without that kind of pre stuff I'm just gonna go full screen here and uh, dive into it right so um to get your attention I'm gonna go st go straight uh, straight into a demo uh, and I hope this works uh, it was pre-recorded, but it'll be interesting to see if it streams okay. So there's a, uh, hopefully you can see this. There's a lot going on here. On the top left of the screen is a live view of a connected phone. So this isn't a simulator. It's literally an iPhone, um, and I'm I'm pulling frames off of it. Um, on the bottom left is a Python script or a little Python, an interactive prompt, whatever you want to call it, the bash session, but it will be launching a script that will be driving everything. And on the right, is actually I'm remote desktop into this my little Raspberry Pi. Um, so effectively, uh, the top light right corner is kind of you can see like the log files behind the scenes. There's the server running, and then in the front, uh, the images that it takes for the demo will be showing up. So I'm just going to go ahead and oh, click play. Okay, so first thing first, it's going to this is my hello world for computer vision and AI based approaches to testing. Basically just to go to a calculator app and do one plus one. In this particular case, I'm doing 12 plus 22 equals 34. The inside joke there is 34 is the um, an element number for Selenium. Um, so that, that, that happened pretty quick, right? You can see that um, we're actually doing some assertions and we even did an OCR test. Uh, we're looking for the number 34 on the screen and uh, all of the images that were taken showed up on that top right. And so it's a little confusing, but hold on, I'll dive into it. I'm going to now show you what the computer sees. So I'm, I'm going to be double clicking on the images that effectively the, all the little snapshots that it took along the way to kind of uh, figure out whether it should proceed or not. So the first thing is just a regular old screenshot, the very first thing it top takes. This is now. You know, if you've seen the movie Terminator and the, occasionally they uh, briefly show the look of the world through the Terminator's eyes. Well, this is the view of the robot's eyes looking at the screen. Um, breaking this down, 
On the far right is a grayscale version of the, the raw image. On the far left is the template that it's looking for. And in this particular case, at the beginning of the test, it was looking for the number one. Uh, and then the middle is this pre-processed image. Um, I make it high contrast and uh, and invert it to make sure it's like basically pre-process it, make it really easy for computer vision. And so in my first test, I'm basically saying, look for the one button, I'm looking for this template. So look for that top left, you know, that that one button that I cropped, that, that's what that little thumbnail is in the top left corner. And then it, when it finds a match, it draws all the lines between all the different matches that it finds. So that worked for number one. I also have a different version of this, which I, it's something I had to learn to do uh, to make it even more accurate in the, in the future. This is called a mask. Uh, and so you basically crop away everything. If you kind of know roughly where on the screen you want the thing or you expect it to be, then you crop away everything else. You mask away everything else. So that worked both pre, before, with and without a mask. It also looked for, found the number two. I'm also looking for the plus sign. Uh, that also worked with the mask. And then uh, I think the next thing. Oh, I'm not sure if I got frozen there. Anyway, um, it then looks for the 34. I wonder, last time I, I scrubbed around here, it uh, it crashed my computer. So <laughs> maybe we'll come back to it. Um, but that's that's the rough demo. I wanted to get that over with to kind of show you what the heck we're doing. Yeah, what, what, what all this is about. I'll go into more details at the very end. But briefly, like, how did we get here? Um, so the very brief, this isn't a history lesson. Uh, most of this stuff is supposed to be, you know, practical things you can use in your day job. Uh, and so um, I've been around, done a bunch of things. So I'll just kind of speed run my little bio here. 2004, I started the Selenium project. 2008, I started Sauce Labs. 2012, um, as CTO at Sauce Labs, I started the uh, the Appian project or started that um, with uh, Dan Quayer originally, and then also Jonathan Lips uh, took over um, running that project uh, from there. And from 2015, uh, basically for the last nine years, I've been full-time at Tapster working on robots. And the thing is like, then, you know, what exactly have I been doing at Tapster? Um, this is my first robot. Um, and literally the design spec for this was... Um, uh, play Angry Birds. It was more of an art project. I did not actually think um, this was going to be like the next kind of pivot in my career. Um, but I can briefly show you a demo of what that looked like. So that was, uh, this is the Tapture 2 playing Angry Birds. Uh, and then fast forward to uh, the, our most recent robot. This is the Tapture 3. And then of course, obligatory, uh, Robot playing Angry Birds this is the T3 Plus on a tablet uh, playing it. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I've given talks about this. Uh, ironically, I will, uh, using this approach, not doing, I, I've actually moved, I've switched from uh, the Angry Birds demo to calculator apps. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll explain that later as well. Um, but uh, anyway. I've been having fun making all these robots over the years, right? So the, the thing is, it's kind of like, why robots, right? Most people are focusing on using uh, either cloud services with Selenium or Appium, and uh, not a lot of people have been using the actual physical robots, although uh, we've, we've been having fun. Uh, but it usually comes down to um, one of the, or actually one of the, one of the things where I started with was observations about the universe, is that automation tools always come later after some new platform comes on. There's always manual testing. Manual testing always comes first. And then there was this kind of like intellectual kind of thought process of like, what is it about manual testing that um, is always uh, like when the automation tools aren't there, you always kind of lean back on, well, let's just, well, we have to do it manually. Um, and it comes down to, well, um, you need a, the, the, you know, the distilled down essence of a manual tester is a having a finger and an eyeball, right? And so that's basically what my robots were, were um, a robotic finger and then cameras to see the screen. The the first part of uh, doing all this stuff, it was I was really trying to figure out the mechanical part of the finger part. And now a lot of the emphasis, uh, now that like the robotics is working, um, now the emphasis is on the computer vision and the eyeball part and all the software that goes into it. Uh, and it's just as a complex of a, pro uh, a problem as the mechanical side. Uh, and the, this is a kind of a way I, I view uh, 
where I am in the industry, I guess, in the sense of on one side, you have manual testing and the other end you have automated. And both of those are actually kind of stable points. It makes sense. Like you can imagine, like if you had got some new software, you can get all your friends together and just click a bunch of buttons and do it manually. And that's fine. That works. A lot of the industry does that, right? At the full, at the other end of the spectrum, you have Selenium and Appium on all the other cloud services. And that's very robust. And uh, I'm just kind of this weird person in the middle doing kind of effectively kind of man like following approach of manual testing, this robot finger and eyeball kind of thing, but doing it in an automated way. It's kind of like, it's, it's been fun. Um, but there's been this big pivot and actually kind of leads up to the, the point of today's talk was this particular robot we did for a client. Basically, this was effectively the last kind of platform we built because um, they said this wasn't going to work. Even though we put, uh, what they wanted was one robot on a rail, and they were going to use this to process or provision like, you know, 30 tablets at a time. And I'm going to show you a video of it briefly. I was very proud of this. Um, I had no idea to actually how to ship it to them. So um, I actually put it in my uh, my car and drove it to them. Um, and they were impressed, but they ended up not going with it. They ended up um, using a circuit board, um, a Pi Pico uh, can actually, this is one of those things of like, it wasn't obvious. 10 years ago, but it's obvious now, you don't need a robot, a physical robot, to actually do a lot of the automation. Uh, maybe some of my friends probably told this to me 10 years ago and I wasn't listening. But uh, it's a particular thing of like, I'm very customer driven. And, you know, at least for a long time, people were still asking for robots. But in this particular case, they said, no, we, uh, even though this was awesome and fast and whatever, we're just going to get 30 PyPicos and, uh, and go from there. Um, and, and specifically, the PyPico can act like a mouse and keyboard instead of having to do the physical uh, tapping. And that was the key insight. So I went off and tried to figure out, like, OK, what does this mean? Is this the death of the company? I can't sell any more robots anymore um, if they can get replaced by these little cheap circuit boards. And so I figured, um, well, I could either fight that or kind of lean into it. Um, so I, and you know, that was the big question for the last couple of years was, like, no more robots. Um, and then I have a choice. Am I a robotics company or automation company? And uh, realize it's more of the it's about the automation, not necessarily the mechanical robots. So I really started to pursue this Raspberry Pi Pico virtual mouse and keyboard approach, virtual robot approach, basically, right? And this is where we are now. Uh, maybe two years ago, this is kind of what I came up with, like the first proof of concept. And again, this isn't really an ad for this. This is something that you could build yourself. These are beams. A maker beam is something you can you can get. Um, or you can use any kind of construction tool, like literally just some sticks and <laughs> whatever. Uh, breaking this apart, um, or sorry, labeling it. This is the first version we had. It was a Pi Zero. And you can't really quite see it, but underneath the Pi Zero is, a, is the Pi camera. That's looking down at a phone. And then the really important part, which is effectively the replacement for my robots, is that connected USB cable plugged into the phone. Uh, and the way it works is the Raspberry Pi or any Linux computer can act as a mouse and keyboard. It uses the USB HID protocol. And once you plug it in, it says, I'm a mouse and keyboard. It sends mouse and keyboard events and, and that's it. Uh, and then to close the loop, to make this like a, you know, actual like automated test that if I send a mouse or keyboard event, make sure it works, I can use the camera and computer vision to look down. And, uh, and that was like the early proof of concepts. Um, as we got it out, we also realized that you not you, you might not even need the camera for some high end phones, like all iPhones or high end Samsungs. You can actually just get the video out, so then that makes it even simpler. Uh, looking at the guts of this stuff, uh, this is the internals. It's a Raspberry Pi. In the middle here, the fancy thing here is a HDMI capture card, um, and you can kind of if you uh, do an Amazon search. You can look for that. Uh, also, right next to it, world's smallest uh, HDMI cable. It connects uh, this adapter to, uh, to that board. Um, and this, these are the same components, very similar to uh, other things called uh, IP over uh, or KVM over IP. Uh, open source project is called um, Pi KVM, or a, another variation of that is called Tiny Pilot. It's the same concept where you're taking, uh, you're sending keyboard and mouse events into a connected device, and you're taking the video out. In this particular case, you could kind of say this is like Pi KVM, but for mobile, 
uh, at, so in the future, I, that, and that's an open source project. I look forward to kind of like talking with that group and seeing if we can kind of um, join forces of sorts. Um, and then of course, on the far right, this is like a, a particular kind of multi-port adapter that you can plug in your phone. Um, and so, you know, maybe when phones were first launched, they were very locked down, but now they're basically like PCs and these, these things can effectively kind of let you plug in USB devices, HDMI, all kinds of stuff. Uh, one other, and you can kind of see, um, maybe explaining just the bottom part, the uh, this silvery, shiny thing that looks kind of clear, uh, that is preventing the power uh, from the Raspberry Pi going back into the phone. Um, so you want to keep like the power sources kind of separate. The phone is charged independently and the Raspberry Pi is. So basically what, what is only going over the wire is just the data, not the power lines. Fancier version of this, uh, if I can talk with somebody with uh, you know a proper EE background, we can kind of figure out how to do a, a more streamlined version of this. Um, now, diving into the software, a uh, very, very high level the software stack for this is the Raspberry Pi OS. Everything is running on the Raspberry Pi. And I'm using Python. Uh, over the years, I've, I've gone back and forth between Python and, and JavaScript or Node.js, but the Python, the computer vision bindings and, and all the examples are just so well done on the Python side. Uh, everything I do now is, is Python based. Um, and then also kind of fun fact on the side note, um, th there's kind of a, this advice floating around that you should probably learn three things if you're going to like pick or three programming languages, JavaScript, obviously, if you're going to do some browser stuff, and then uh, basically a dynamic language and a compiled language. And uh, Python, especially for computer vision or AI stuff, that's that's obvious. What's not obvious is what to learn as a compiled language. Uh, seems like these days the argument is between Go or Rust. Uh, but I would argue, um, well, what I've been playing with is Nim. If I'm going to do some like native stuff to make everything go faster, Nim is basically like a compiled fast Python, but no one knows about it. No one knows it exists. Anyway, if, if you take one thing away from this talk, uh, it's like, what is this Nim? I should go check it out. Uh, Jason Huggins said to check it out. Go check it out. Um, I would love to have more Nim programmers in the world. Anyway, um, I also use OpenCV, Tesseract, that's specifically for uh, the open, for the uh, uh, optical character recognition. Um, sometimes you want to do image-based approaches, and other times you just want to do assertions like find this text, right? But they also kind of work hand in hand. Sometimes you have to pre-process the image with OpenCV to make Tesseract better at its job. And then as far as the kind of setup for this, like the um, architecture, it's the sim it's the same as Selenium and Appium. It's H it's JSON data sent over uh, HTTP. And this is roughly diving into that that architecture. This is an example of uh, a web driver under the hood, not through your like favorite language binding, but what is getting sent over the wire if to send a click is something that looks like a post and then to a session element click. Or if you have a bunch of actions, you would you would bundle them up and send it to an actions endpoint. My API right now, um, I didn't set out to have Appium and Selenium compatibility uh, like API level compatibility uh, on the very first version. I just want to see if anything can work. That's kind of like my shtick of like, just get this thing basically working and then I can iterate from there. So a future version of this would be basically to kind of morph my API to match uh, the web driver spec more closely. Cause then you, at that point, then you can inherit and use all the Appium and Selenium uh, client libraries for this, right? Um, anyway. Some of the lessons learned on the computer vision side. I started, I have this, this gets me in trouble sometimes um, uh, in a weird way. Um, people think I'm like this senior, uh, sophisticated, wise person who has uh, these um, great ideas about how to build these huge architectures. But usually it's like, no, I make this barely working, simple prototype, effectively one step removed from Hello World. And I keep moving from there. And so my 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 attitude is always start small, start with the absolute simplest th thing that could possibly work, which means I did not start with AI. Um, apologies to everyone who's selling AI stuff these days, and it probably works. But as far as trying to understand how all these things to, uh, work together, I start with the simplest thing. And the absolute simplest thing means old school pre-AI OpenCV techniques. And the simplest one of all of them is called match template. It literally looks for a thumbnail image 
And it does almost like a pixel by pixel comparison across the entire, scans the entire image. And that can work when everything is perfect. And I've learned that um, the hard way, that it's it's very um, flaky. It's not fault tolerant at all. If um, if anything is different, match template will will fail. Uh, so you get a lot of false negatives. Um, but I, the very first versions of some of the stuff I was working on, it it worked enough to kind of keep me going. And you know, even um, but it, I, I knew that I was going to have to use more complicated methods. And so that's kind of just been climbing the stack of complexity. The next th two things that I've, I've now jumped on, and that's where I am right now. It's These are considered old school pre-AI techniques, but they work well enough. I probably have a, a missing slide here where there's like AI versus just old, like old school versus new school. Um, one of the advantages of the old school stuff is that they're a little bit more deterministic, or actually they are deterministic, uh, and uh, they're faster. Than some of the AI approaches, but the AI approaches are more, um, what do you call it? If you, if it's anything in your test has to get, um, redone, like, uh, the UI changes or something that the, the machine learning AI approaches potentially make it so that it's easier to maintain the test. So it's not an either or, but, um, I did not jump straight into the chat GPT ver way of doing all of this. And I'll actually, I'll, I'll also come back to that at the end. Um, I did ask ChatGPT to do a similar version of my demo and it, it didn't work. It still doesn't work. I did that demo or asked ChatGPT to do my demo this morning and it, it did not work. Uh, this is roughly the, 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 the all this is the Python code or a, a snapshot of what I had to implement to find the elements. I'm not going to go into this line by line. It's a lot of stuff. Um, but it's basically, I, I grab a screenshot, do a bunch of pre-processing. I turn it to, I turn it to grayscale, I blur it, um, I you know convert the contrast, I do a bunch of stuff, and then uh, apply these things called uh, uh, sift and flan for finding all of these individual features between the template and the image. And then if it's above a certain threshold, uh, it's considered a, you know, we found it, right? And this is, you have to do all of this stuff. It's kind of like, um, it was, Selenium was, um, it was nice when you had the document object model. You could just ask the page, where is a thing? And it would just tell you where it is. In this computer vision-based approach, you have to come up, you basically have to reverse engineer a document object model. All you have are pixels and you have to go find the elements on the screen. So um, if, if possibly some version of this effectively becomes like this, this, this code that you see might someday come to a Selenium or Appium near you with a, it becomes a new kind of locator, like a find element. So you, um, and, and I think even there is the find elements like via image in Appium. I think it's using match template. Um, anyway, someone can fact check me on this, but we'll probably be inserting more and more kind of ways to do it. Okay, about that chat GPT question. Um, I did upload the screenshot of my calculator app and I gave it a very simple prompt. Uh, find the number one button in, you know, in the screenshot and give me the XY coordinate. And it very quickly and confidently came back and said, yep, it's at, found it. It's at X1111, one, 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 or 111 and Y486. Uh, it's hard to translate that in your mind to like, was that correct or not? So I also asked it next, you know, next line, highlight that for me, right? And it very confidently said, here is, I've highlighted the number one in your screenshot. And as you can see, it is totally not correct, right? Uh, so this is the state of the art, right? <laughs> um, when you're doing completely vision-based, this is effectively represents an app that you don't have at the access to source code, or you're not using a low-level approach like Appium to go ask for the list of elements um, and you know tell it the x, y coordinate. This is purely just based on image-based approaches. Um, the other thing that's kind of confusing right now in the AI large language model space is the specific thing that you need for this approach is a multimodal large language model. So that's what the latest jet GPT is. But the, the latest one from uh, Facebook or Meta, the Llama 3, um, they announced it, like their, their latest one was not multimodal. And then they add 
We've got a different name for the... Uh, it gets confusing. There's large language models that could potentially generate source code for you. But the thing I need for this approach is that it needs to be able to, I need to upload a screenshot and then tell it, hey, find a thing, tell me the coordinate, because then I can feed that into my little robot and click it. Um, but it, as long as it keeps getting tripped up on this simple thing, um, I can't really depend on these approaches. And even if it worked, it's still kind of slow. You're using a lot of APIs going to the cloud. Um, but I look forward to this just working someday. But this is my acid test. I, I so two things, <laughs> we get two things out of this talk. One, I would love to have more NIM, NIM programmers in the world. But two, the hello world for like the acid test for can can AI do uh, test automation, upload it a screenshot of a calculator and tell it to do one plus one equals two. And if it can, then, then we're onto something. So far right now, every multimodal um, LLM that I've tried, and also the other one I tried was Lava, LLAVA 1.5. Uh, that also didn't work and it was slower. Anyway, um, so someday soon, maybe, I don't know, on the on the AI side of things. Uh, but the the next steps for, for me is that uh, not a lot of people know what I've been up to. Um, we've just been kind of like, kind of just making these kind of prototypes work. But one of the things I'm trying to do is trying to get this approach out. Again, this is not meant to be an ad for my specific thing. It's you can get your own Raspberry Pi and a camera and take screenshots off of devices and start kind of doing this yourself. Uh, but it it is not easy. Um, and so there is a lot of documentation for the kind of lower level Selenium and Appium ways of doing things. The computer vision approaches, um, they just haven't been well documented yet. So, you know, giving this talk is one step in that direction, but I'll have to kind of, uh, you know, keep working on that, right? Um, also, I think the next step in complexity, I probably will do some more machine learning. There's this gap between the old school OpenCV methods that I've been using and the full AI large language model, multimodal things. Um, I think I could just do my own uh, machine learning training. Um, the nice thing about doing machine learning with uh, user interface testing is that you could do, you could probably have more of an opportunity to do really good um data like what do you call it synthetic data creation um because i can give it basically like here's a circle and then i can use an algorithm to create all kinds of circles and maybe rotate them a little bit change the coloring so everything about machine learning training is all about having as much data as possible so i could probably even just from one screenshot and one little template create a whole bunch of machine learning i could probably generate a lot of the training data that i would need to automate this app um, so that's kind of approach. I feel like most of the people in the machine learning world, they're training on pictures of nature um, or stuff that makes it easier for, uh, you know, self-driving cars to navigate roads. Not a lot of people are, are publishing uh, training models specifically targeted and tailored to user interface testing. The folks a couple of years ago at um, Alibaba did, um, but it feels like there's more people should be working on that. Um, also, some other things that I kind of need to work on, even though in, in this talk, I've been focusing on like just highlighting some of the computer vision side, but on the native events side of things, some things are still tripping me up. Um, a couple of things, when you have, uh, when you're a user just using your phone, you don't, you're not, you know, starting at the top left-hand corner and then dragging your finger to the button. You just touch the position. So there's this big thing about relative position versus absolute positioning. When I use a mouse to move around, I like right now, I have to move to the top left corner and then uh, count my steps going you know, down and left or right to the button that, when I, that I want to click. Um, at least on the iPhone, it does not support absolute positioning. Um, so I have to do this kind of absolute Baked out absolute by relative. I always start in the home position and then I navigate. Uh, anyway, so it's like the, the mouse movements could be cleaned up. Um, also on the Android side, it does support um, absolute positioning or at least native touch events. And so um, right now it's just mouse and keyboard, but I'll be looking to kind of like literally just make it so it just does an absolute jump, just like your finger would, a jump straight to a button and click there and not have to move relative. Um, and that also kind of, speaks to this kind of more philosophical thing of, if I'm using a fake mouse and keyboard, how, from a testing perspective, is that close enough, identical enough to how a user would be using the system 
if we consider those equivalent, right? Um, and I didn't really, I didn't really go into the detail here, but there are effectively two approaches, uh, two uses for this approach. One of them is this testing approach, right? And you're trying to get it to be as human-like as possible. Uh, but the other one is like device provisioning. Um, probably some people are here like, why don't you just, uh, you know, if it's an Android device, just turn on ADB and just and do it that way. You don't need the Raspberry Pi, whatever. But um, if you're doing device provisioning, and that's what that original robot on the rail was for, like from the welcome screen, um, ADB is not turned on, the uh, the Android debug protocol, right? And so it becomes a, a circular thing of like, you would have to manually automate, you'd have to like manually click a bunch of things to get to the welcome, to the home screen to then enable ADB so then you could automate it. But if you wanted to automate a device, you effectively wanted to you know, automate the setting up a device from the welcome, like right out of the box. This approach is the only approach. Um, so in that particular case, the, the difference between touch versus mouse and keyboard doesn't really matter as long as you can automate it at all. There, in that scenario, the the actually only alternative is um, people and manual testing. So this gives you an approach. Um, but if you use this approach from a test automation context, you, you then have this question of like, is this close enough to human behavior? Uh, and I've kind of noticed that on like even the you know using a keyboard to automate a mobile app, the keyboard navigation approach sometimes is an afterthought. It might accidentally work. So there's this thing of like, if you're testing something, if you had high requirements for it, it had to be tested just like a human. That's where you might still actually use those, that three axis robot to actually touch the screen. Like if you're doing a medical device or, or something for um, like in the car industry, uh, you might be required to actually touch the screen uh, and you, you're not, you wouldn't be allowed to send fake events, right? Anyway, so that's just, just on the um, touch mouse keyboard events. There's a lot to be cleaned up there. And then the last point is configuration and calibration. Uh, just like with the robot stuff, there, there's this kind of, uh, you can you can see in pixels where something is, but there's a difference between the pixels of the screenshot you have and kind of the the, the screen resolution of, uh, of the device itself. So when you tell it to move 100 units, just because it's 100 pixels on your um, on what you see doesn't mean that moving hundred goes the same. Like there's some kind of calibration there that you have to do. And, and right now it's kind of messy and you have to kind of map between the two. I hope to kind of keep cleaning that up because that's no fun. And that kind of keeps people from kind of doing this approach. So that I kind of sped through, uh, sped run through my, um, all my slides and material. Um, I have a little bit of extra time. I'm going to see if I actually can do a live demo version of what I showed you before, just so I can kind of show you, um, kind of go back to the original demo, basically should give you the demo again and maybe slow it down. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring up the, my, my stuff. Um, I'm now, I, I stopped sharing my presentation so I can now see the chat for the first time. Does that makes sense. Um, like, do I have any, like, um, Thumbs up to see if like, <laughs> okay, great, great, great. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. I think this time I'm going to do a full screen. Wait, oh, I see uh, who needs ChatGPT when you just have the magic eight ball. Yeah, that's true. Um, oh man, okay, okay, I'm gonna enjoy going back and seeing these comments before. Okay, I'm going to stop presenting and I'm gonna share my, whole screen. And this might break, um, but you're not, you know, I like to live a little bit dangerously here. So entire screen. And I, I really have no idea if this will work. Okay. So I'm going to move that and move that. And hopefully you can see I'm going to clear up my, let's see if I have, oh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and bring up the, um,
browser window, like the live, the live view of the uh, device. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your uh, patience here. Okay, entire screen again. It looks like I got about five more minutes uh, for this whole presentation. Okay, so hopefully you can see top left corner, the live view, and this is now the live video stream. So if I um, move around, uh, this is like using that video capture card that I showed you. Um, and so I can kind of click around one, one, two plus two, two equals 34 or one plus one equals two. Um, yeah, there's really, yeah, this is the live view, right? You can see all the apps that I have installed. So there's that. And then I'm um, going to go ahead and try it. And then also I've got this little thing where I can kind of click around here. I can manually control the, uh, the device through this web interface. Apple uh, did something, uh, revealed something similar to this at their keynote a couple months ago, but they don't, but they didn't make it in the test automation context. So that's why it's still kind of useful. Um, okay. So I'm going to not do live stream. I'm going to go, ah, go to a screenshot. If I can type cancel, there you go. And I am going to run the demo. And there's a reason I can't live stream. <laughs> there's another little bug fix I have. Um, I'm just going to take a rapid list of screenshots instead of live video. I have to make everything thread safe. And so I can't like stream the video and do all of, like the testing stuff at the same time working on it. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, you know what? I forgot to I forgot to clear it. So actually, this is a good live test. It found what it saw thirty five, and it thought it was S I E. Um, so the test failed. Let's. But I think it was because I didn't have the good starting conditions, right? So let's, this is really a live demo. Um, let's clear out all of the files. And now let's see if that works. So it's 12 plus 22. Sweet. All right. And then that works. OK. And then we are going to now jump in and see what the, what, what the computer saw. The first thing it does is just take a screenshot uh, just just for the heck of it. And then this is what uh, it saw. So it, it had uh, basically I, I concatenated three images that on the on the left is the template that it's looking for. The middle one is the pre profit pre processed image. When it finds a match, it basically draws a very bright line connecting all of the features that it found. So that was a match and it worked with or without the mask. Same thing for the number two. Um, also found the plus and it found the equal sign. Um, and also I, I skipped the part where I used the equal sign and mask for whatever reason it couldn't work. Uh, and then also I hit the equal button and then looked for using the Tesseract. I use, um, excuse me, the test search to find or the text, uh, OCR search to find the numbers 34 and, and it found it there. Um, and there's that. And if, making it a really live test. Let's see if I can change the demo to, uh, let's see if I get to my source code here. Look for, there we go. Instead of looking for 34, I'm gonna change it to um, 35. So before and before and after, show you that it, it really is real. Okay, I'm gonna clear out everything and run the demo again. I'm just gonna start rapidly taking all the little screenshots. 
And this should fail because it's going to be looking for 35, but hopefully 34 will be on the screen. And when it can't find the thing it's looking for, it, tr it goes into a loop and tries looking for it several times. So you can kind of see that on the log file on the bottom left, it's looking for 34. Sorry, it found 34 looking for 35. It tries three times, I think, and then bombs out. Image not found. So this is kind of the approach. Uh, so si again, also similar with uh, Selenium or Appium approaches that you kind of have to do a wait for element. Uh, and sometimes the wait for doesn't show up. Uh, and then you it becomes this uh, question, just like anything else, how long should you wait? It's pretty easy when it's a calculator app. I think it, it's just one page and uh, and that's it. But if you're doing uh, some kind of page transition, then it becomes just like any other arguments about how you do the automation. Um, you know, what what should, you know, what should, how long should you wait for? Anyway, okay, so that demo worked. Woohoo! I'm going to stop sharing again. And we should have just enough time for q and A, I I think. So uh, yeah, that's my talk. Thanks for coming to my talk. Yep, thank you, Jason. So wow, I just learned about the name for the first time. And it's, I might have to say, like it's like finding a hidden gem in the programming world. Thank you for introducing the name to us. And now we can take a couple of questions. I'll put on the stage. Yep, so first question is, why is the vision first approach sometimes necessary? Right. I apologize if, if I didn't make that so obvious, uh, but very much in a device provisioning context, if you are in charge of, if you've got a whole bunch of tablets that you have to get ready to give out to somebody and literally you just, you literally have a stack of tablets and you have to get them from the welcome screen, like literally when you power it on for the first time from the store to the home screen and you have to install apps, change settings, add it to a Wi-Fi. There's literally no other way. There's manual, like get a whole bunch of people and do it for you or use this virtual mouse and keyboard approach to it. And then from a testing point of view, there's these things where you have to enter, where you interact with the world. Sometimes it's it's not just a mobile phone, but it's a mobile phone with a card reader. Um, there's some kind of like, or sometimes you're it's like where, where there's this intersection with the real world. Um, mm -hmm. But also really because it comes down to, um, this is kind of a tool of last resort. If you had access to this, if you could do it with Selenium or Appium or literally any other tool, um, you could do that way. The, the, I think the other thing is that this approach is complement is a complement. This fake mouse and keyboard approach is a complement to the AI approaches. When ChatGPT can finally find the elements on the screen from a pixel point of view, um, it will then, uh, you know, you'll you'll want to give it. Uh, send that information to a device that can just go ahead and click it. Um, and so it really comes down to the the future, uh, it, or if you're in a scenario where um, all you have are the pixels on the screen, you don't have the low level. Um, that Anyway, it's, it's kind of like, it's sorry, I'm over answering the question. If you have no other way to do it, this is the way to do it. OK, thank you for addressing that, Jason. So we have a couple of minutes, and we can take one more question, if possible. So. How does vision first automation handle accessibility and cross device testing? Uh, so on the iPhone, you actually have to turn on accessibility to be able to, it, it's relying on accessibility features in the iPhone to make it work. You have to turn on accessibility and then turn on uh, assistive touch and that's how it works. Um, uh, but if you're testing accessibility itself, then that becomes kind of a more philosophical question we'll have to take offline. What was the second part of that question? It was accessibility and then something else, cross device. Yep. Cross oh, right. So, I, right. So this approach, this Raspberry Pi approach, um, it works both. It works both for Android and iOS. Uh, so that's there's another project I, f I forgot. It's like um, Appium Test Lab, I think. Um, so uh, there's a couple of folks from like ThoughtWorks. Um, ironically, that project, yeah, the company where I started Selenium at ThoughtWorks all those years ago. Um, th they're they're doing a similar approach. And I think it's working, uh, works cross platform, uh, Android and iPhone. Got it. Okay, Jason, thank you for that explanation. I'm sure that that clarified many things for the attendees. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And I also want to remind all the attendees that these sections are recorded and it will be on the Lambda Test YouTube channel. So you can go back and design them again and share with them to your peers. 
So have a great day. Thank you.